Be reading from the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 18. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by the angels proved to be reliable and Every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, He left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil." And deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered, when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. You may be seated. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's bow together and honor our Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you thankfully because of your promise fulfilled in Jesus Christ for our salvation before you even created time for us. Thank you for the drawing of your Holy Spirit and the power of the word of God that drew us unto yourself. Thank you for providing the faith we needed to believe. Father, as we gather this morning to worship as a congregation, you, your Son, and the Holy Spirit, that we would allow the word preached to do its work in us without interference by our thoughts, our worries, our concerns, but we would give you the freedom to take that and cause us to be 
being transformed by the renewing of our mind through this preaching of the word of God. And Lord, as a congregation, worship continues throughout the day and so many preparations by so many gathering together in unity to perform this ministry of the sharing of the gospel through VBS. Thank you for who you will send here and gather. Thank you of what you will accomplish in lives of some who have never heard the gospel and what you will do in lives of, of those who have, some that have faith already but need an encouragement and, and a confidence We set this time in front, of, in front of you, thanking you for it and asking that you would bless it. And now accept our singing as a form of praise, our listening to your word as a form of praise, and our obedience to the word preached as a form of praise. And we ask this in our Savior's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we sing, Come Thou Fount. Through 23. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the, fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let's stand and sing the words together of our story, our song, and our blessed assurance in Him, Christ.
Well, today is Father's Day, as you know, and the Spirit in His perfect wisdom has led us to one of the most paternal passages in all the Bible. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. If you are visiting with us this morning, we, are, we have just begun, we've been here about a month now, we've just begun the book of Ephesians, Paul's epistle to the, church, the churches in the region at Ephesus. And we are in chapter 1, read verses 5 and 6 for you, and then in just a moment I I will reread the text, but I'm going to start in verse 3. So just to introduce the idea of why why I'm saying that this is a paternal passage, look with me at verse 5, but actually I'd like like you to start at the end of verse 4, because I think those last two words of verse 4, in love, introduces verse 5 for us, so... Verse 5 should read this way, in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. I say that this is a, a, a paternal passage because it deals with, it teaches us about the adoption of of God's children, God our Father, adopting for Himself children. And so on Father's Day, as a father, I, I become particularly reflective, as I'm sure other dads in the room do. And I was thinking this week about the, the moment that each of my children were, were born, that moment when they were born when they came into the world, when they see light for the first time and you hear them cry. And now each one of my children, though they looked very much alike as babies, had differing birth, first seconds, first moments. Everly, my oldest, literally dove into the world. She had her hand up by her face and she dove out into the world. And I had been reading to Everly, I read to Everly a lot while she was in mommy's tummy. And I'll never forget, I think I've shared with this before, I'll never forget the moment she was born. She didn't cry very much when she, when she was born. And I spoke to her. She immediately quieted and stopped and turned her neck towards where she'd heard that voice. And I'll never forget the reality that my, my newborn, that I had never seen before and that had never seen me, knew me, knew my voice. Leighton was born ready and raring to go to take on the world. Leighton was born with big burly shoulders and he's still got them. He also didn't cry very much when he was born. Lily came out into the world deciding to crash her brother's second birthday party. We were eating cake, and I looked at my wife, and I realized that she couldn't eat cake through contractions. And so I said, honey, we need to go to the hospital. And she said, no, my son is getting his birthday party. I said, well, then we're going to have a baby in the living room. And that seemed to deter her. So I remember on the way to the hospital, she's finishing her cake in the car. The baby's not going to keep mama from cake, right? And almost two hours later, she was born. She cried more than the other two. She came out looking just like older sissy. She was smaller than the others. Some of you know that moment, and if you don't, just wait, it's coming for you, and if the Lord has children for you, that moment when you first see that child, you don't know what they're going to look like, they don't know what you look like because they still can't see you, 
but feeling like you have always loved that child. Feeling like you've always known that child. Like there was never, there was never a split second when your knowledge of that child and your love for that child ceased. You just always loved that child. But we have an awareness and a knowledge of time and space and that, that moment our love begins and we really begin to understand that love. When it's first, not, not begins is probably not the best way to say it, but when, when it's fully realized, that, when, when that love is realized in the moment of the child's birth. And this morning we'll look together at one of the most astounding realities of God, in my opinion, one of my favorite things about God. Everyone has doctrine that they love or something particularly about a truth of Christianity or something. Maybe, and maybe you're not a Christian. Maybe you're busy with this morning and, and you've not believed in Christ for your salvation. And everything I'm going to say to you, maybe is you've heard it for the first time. This morning, I'm going to share with you one of the most, if not in my opinion, the most astounding things about Christianity. And that is that God wants to be Father. No other religion has a God who wants to be Dad. So we are in Ephesians chapter 1. I read verses 5 and 6 to you, but I want to set it back in context. So I'm going to read from verse 3 down to verse 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us, for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. This morning on Father's Day, I know that the day brings up many Emotions for some, this differing experiences for some, but I know it's true that if you don't have children, you've had a father. And some of you may have very difficult memories of your father. Some of you may have blessed memories of your father. I, I am fortunate to have only good, blessed memories of my father. And many of you, that's your experience. Many of you have memories of your father that you perhaps would like to forget. This morning, we're going to see a passage of Scripture that teaches us about the perfect Father. And that if you have a Father that you look back in your life and there are some things you wish you could forget, or even if it was less than ideal, or there was tension there, there was no reconciliation, or if you had a wonderful Father, you have a wonderful Father, this Father is for you. And He is for you Because He has chosen you to be His. This morning, I want want you to see from this passage that the chosen children of God know His pleasure and bring Him praise. The chosen children of God know His pleasure and bring Him praise. Let's pray and we'll begin to work through verses 5 and 6 together. Father, I ask that if there are some with us this morning who have not confessed Christ, so everything they hear this morning about being one of your children is not true of them, I pray that you would draw because no one comes unless the Father draws. And so I pray that you would draw and that a family member is added today. For your children that are here, would you astound us By your goodness, shock us again with your love. 
so that we offer you praise that you deserve. And we ask these things in the name of the one who is not ashamed to be called our brother, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, this passage obviously has a specific context, and those who've those who've been with us will, will kind of understand where we've been. And if you haven't been, let me just catch you up really quickly. Or even if you have been and you need a refresher, we've talked about some pretty deep and powerful things. So let's just do some quick review. Remember verse 3 kind of sets up everything that happens in verses 3 to 14. It is a description, this long sentence, this is one of, of three long sentences in the book of Ephesians. This is the longest one. In fact, it's the longest sentence in the New Testament. And it explains for us everything that, that God has, not everything, but, but the, the highlights of what God has done for us in and through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this word blessed in verse 3 is an attribute, is an expression, of, is an adjective of, of who God is. And so everything to follow is... A, a, a more full understanding of the second part of that verse, how he has blessed us. Blessed be the God and Father, of Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And so the rest of this long sentence down to, from verses 3 to 14 is really fleshing out these blessings. What are these blessings? And this first one that we discussed last week is the idea of election, that God has chosen himself a people before the foundation of the world, outside of time and space, that God knew his people and that he would choose them for his glorious purposes. To build on this idea of election even further, Paul continues this argument and uses a very similar idea. In fact, some Some theologians, some commentators are going to say that election and predestination are really the same thing. They're just, it's such a different description. So let's look together at this idea of predestination. So starting in verse 5, we see the idea of God's chosen children or the chosen children. So this first blessing of God with which he has blessed us in the heavenly places is election. Paul continues to explain these massive, glorious blessings, none of which, of course, we deserve. We'll talk about that even today, that he has worked all of these things to the praise of his grace. Grace fundamentally means that we don't deserve it. And so this is an expression as well of his grace, That as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world for the specific purpose of making us holy and blameless before him. Paul continues to explain these blessings and this blessing that we get to talk about this morning. These two blessings, predestination to adoption. So verse 5, in love he predestined us for adoption to himself. You say, well what does this word mean? predestination mean it's very similar to the idea of election but it actually it actually maintains even more of a specific idea of marking or of making something very specific that it is it is selected with a mark and so this word this greek word proridzo it has the idea of of marked out before so before space and time god marked out a specific people, and this specific people would be those that he marked out for his adoption, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Paul talks about this idea of predestination in Romans chapter 8, for those whom he foreknew, before what? Before space and time. Outside of humanity's concept of space and time, God knew you. He predestined, if you're in Christ, he knew you. Those who he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. So he predestined for a specific purpose. He picked them out that they would grow into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And those whom he predestined, he also called. No one comes except the Father draws him. And those whom he called, he also justified. This is to declare innocent before him on the basis of Christ's innocence. In other words, before God, before salvation, I stand before God like like a criminal in a court, and I am guilty, but Jesus Christ takes my penalty. He he, He takes upon my sin on himself, and now I stand before God as innocent because Jesus has taken my place. And those whom he 
justified, he also glorified. That is glorification of our body and to be given certain divine rights only available to those who are in the family of God. Now listen, the word doesn't mean only or even primarily that God has a specific location in mind, but a specific purpose in mind. So it's not that he has a place in mind, it's not even so much that he's predestined us to heaven, but that he's predestined us to his purposes, what he is doing. So this is just another way, another blessing in this long paragraph of blessings that teaches us that God's salvation of of a people, of children, was divinely willed by Him outside of eternity, by Him in eternity outside of time and space. This is what we talked about last week, the election, but now it becomes more specific. Remember I said last week... So rewind, rewind with me in the, in, in the rewind button of your mind to last week. That before you and I had an understandable, quantifiable reality that is space and time, God chose a people for himself. And that there was an eternal covenant that was made. That Christ would pay for the sins of those who would believe. The chosen of God. And now he couples this idea with the idea of predestination and specifies it into adoption. So you couple this reality of predestination with the incredible gospel reality of verse 4, election. It is no doubt that the psalmist is correct that salvation is of the Lord. So, as I mentioned, if predestination is predestined to a specific purpose more than a specific place, what is the purpose in verse 5? Even as he chose us, excuse me, verse 5, in love he predestined us for adoption. So, if predestination has the idea of purpose, we should ask from the verse, what is that purpose? And the verse answers it for us. We are predestined to Adoption. This is God's purpose of predestination in verse 5. The purpose in Romans chapter 8 is sanctification, confirmation to the image of Jesus Christ. Here it is predestination to be his sons. This is astounding. This is beautiful. This is incredible. Now I know that this is like really big, deep, kind of way up there stuff. But this, I, I want to let you know one of the things I was praying for you as I was preparing this. I was, pre- I was praying, and I even had specific people in mind, because that's how I pray for our congregation, both generally and specifically, that you would grasp this concept of adoption. You say, why? Because I really do believe that some of you have a view of God that's completely wrong. You have a view of God that maybe he's a big bully up in the sky and he's just telling us what to do. You have a view of God that he just created a bunch of rules for you. You have a view of God maybe on the other end that he's just like this really squishy person who just wants everybody to be happy. Wants to give you what you want. And I... I was praying that this theology would completely change your view of God. Because I really do believe that if you and I could grasp the reality that God has made us His children because He wants to be our Father, in this morning, in these moments, your life could change forever. Your life could change forever. So now let's talk about the reality of being predestined to adoption. So keep in mind, I do not want you to forget this idea of election and predestination, that it is this, and even as we sort of talk about Ephesians, I I gave you that that little guide to Ephesians, and I told you that the book of Ephesians deals with the cosmic gospel, what God is doing in outside of our earth, what God has been doing from, from, from the beginning of what we call time and space, what he had planned before creation. 
This passage will show you that God has things that are massive, that are infinite, that God has things outside of anything that you and I could believe, but it also has God's purpose for you that is intimate and personal and kind and could change you forever. So predestination to adoption. Well, what is this idea of adoption? In other words, or it, it, to really understand this idea of adoption, we have to understand it in the way that Paul means it, because this, this is how we read the Bible. This is how we study the Bible. You and I have a basic working knowledge of what adoption is today, but adoption today doesn't work like adoption did then. They're completely different entities. They're completely different ideas. You and I today, and, and there's a family of the churches doing this right now, and, and we, we're going to be honoring, honoring them soon. We'll be bringing a child into the home and bringing that child into the home and then giving that child, that young child, rights as a part of their home. Biblical adoption or, or first century historic Roman adoption was not actually like that. It wasn't adoption as, adoption as little children for the purpose of, of, of just giving them a better life. So we have to understand the way Paul means adoption, and likely Paul has specifically Roman adoption here in mind, because there really isn't any clear-cut form of Jewish adoption, uh, it, even in the Bible. And the Greek adoption certainly wouldn't have functioned the way that Paul is getting at it here. So ancient Roman adoption was almost always for the purpose of continuing a family line. So for example, like many of you in the church, God only blesses you with daughters, which is a huge blessing. So say you're now in first century Rome and you have wealth and you have land and you have status and you've had daughters, and there's no one to carry on the family name. What do you do? Actually, we see this historically, even in the lives of the Caesars, who only had daughters. The Caesars would adopt. And this, this picture of adoption helps us understand what Paul is getting at. So if you are in your home, and you only have Girls, not only do you have an overabundance of shoes, you lack an heir. So if this situation was true of you, adoption was the most commonplace practice. That you would either find a slave who needed purchased, or you would find a family who was maybe, they were less fortunate and they had less of a means to provide for their children, and you would offer to buy that child from them. Now listen, this next part's very important. Even if you weren't a slave, even if you weren't a slave, the child wasn't a slave, was a part of a family that maybe had less resources and someone comes with lots of money and says, I would like to adopt your child. Even if that child wasn't a slave, that initial purchase would make the child a slave. The initial purchase changed the status of that child to slave. Because of the way that Roman law worked, that child had to be acknowledged as a slave and then bought out of slavery. The process was complex, and actually there was an intermediary time. The child would be bought three times. But at the third purchase, or the, the individual would be bought three times. And in the third purchase, whatever their status was, their, chat, their status immediately changed to that of adopted son. You say, well, why only son? Because daughters were almost never adopted. It would have been unheard of to adopt a daughter. Why? Remember what I told you was the purpose of adoption. To establish an heir. So whether it was a child or whether it was a full-grown adult human slave, it was actually more common for adults to be adopted than children. So 
So whether you were a child, older, because they wouldn't have adopted a young one, they would have adopted someone who showed some sort of aptitude to life, or an adult, human slave, you were purchased and you became a slave, and that third purchase, your status changed to son. Bear in mind that the adoptee had no rights until the passing of the father. That's what an inheritance is. You don't get anything until the father dies. So in summary, just to recap all of that, an adoptee would be chosen with no rights from blood, but by gracious choice, that adoptee needed purchasing, and while the father lived... The adoptee had no rights, and, but, or had no inheritance, but enjoyed rights as if he were part of the family. So it's not at all difficult to make all of this connection to the gospel jump here. We who bore the spiritual status of sinner, cursed, darkened, dead in our trespasses and sins. Slaves to sin, according to Paul. Go to chapter 2 of Ephesians. Children of wrath, according to Paul. And slaves to Satan, according to Jesus. This is who we are before adoption into the family. What if we dared to believe that God would accept us as Citizens into a kingdom. That in our sinful state, we have no rights before Him. Children of wrath, slave to sin. Would God make us a citizen of His kingdom? What if we dared to hope that He would accept us as neighbors in proximity to Him? What if we dared to hope that he would make us servants that he could hire, that we could work off all our debt? Like an indentured slave in Roman culture. But according to our status of sin and death and slavery and children of wrath, we have no right to ask him if we can be children He has taken outsiders, enemies, children of Satan, slaves to sin by means of purchase through Christ's blood and made us sons and daughters. And since he is an eternal and everlasting father, our rights and privileges as children never cease. We have them all now because he will not die. And we have them forever because this was what he intended through adoption. Because as John tells us in chapter 1, to all who did receive him and believed in his name, he gave the right to become children who were born not of flesh, nor of blood, nor of the will, but of God. This is why this reality can change your life. Remembering who you were, who you may be right now, child of wrath, on whom the condemnation of God rightly rests, a slave to sin, and you need someone with currency sufficient and valuable to purchase you out of that slavery. And this is what Paul means by saying, through Jesus Christ. Adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. You say, why does he only say daughters? What is, or sons, why does he leave out the daughters? If, is this only a man's game? 
I think it's, I think it's astounding to know what Paul is actually doing here. He doesn't point, he doesn't say sons and daughters because daughters wouldn't have been adopted. There was no functional purpose for that. So actually what he's saying is that in the family of God, we're all one. We all receive the same rights. We all receive the same benefits. He accepts daughters just like he accepts sons in the same way, for the same purpose, with the same payment. Because God is after a people chosen to himself. But he know what he wants to do with that people? Parent them. Be their father. Not just a nation. A family. So secondly, we look at the securing son, the chosen children. And secondly, the securing Son, this divine adoption is only possible through the cross work of Jesus, namely to accomplish two things. Now, we're, we're not going to discuss it today because the passage focuses on the aspect of Jesus in an adoption, but there's actually a, an aspect of the Holy Spirit in adoption as well. If you look at, if you look at Romans chapter 8, verse 15, where we, we receive the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father, that passage I just read in John, born not of the flesh or nor the, or blood nor the will of man, but born of God. This is the idea of regeneration. So the Holy Spirit's regeneration makes possible our adoption as sons. But what provides the payment out of slavery? Remember I said to be adopted at this time when Paul wrote this, there was some payment that, needed invo- that was involved so that you could be, your freedom could be bought. What buys the freedom? Romans chapter 5, verse 10, For if we were enemies, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Question, how can enemies become family? Before you even get to the theological understanding of God reconciling enemies to himself, there's a logical understanding. You don't bring your enemies to your family reunion. Maybe your enemies are in your family reunion. And in which case, you don't go. This is why reconciliation is necessary. Because God makes peace with humanity, with the believers through the work of Jesus Christ. And once he makes peace, he brings them together. Verse 11, more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. He makes peace. And enemies do not just become friends. They do not just become neighbors. They don't just sign some sort of functional peace contract. They become family. Jesus, the righteous son who meets the standard, brings warring sinners and a righteous God together and makes peace through his holy and sufficient sacrifice. Before our adoption papers was written up, there was written up a peace treaty and it was signed in blood. But what could possibly satisfy both God's requirements and the price of our sin. Paul answers this in Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. I mean that an heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is an owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. So first, adoption is adoption necessitates reconciliation. Secondly, adoption necessitates redemption because redemption is the aspect, is the act of Christ to purchase us by his blood out of sin. Verse 6, and because you are son, God, sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, 
Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So what could satisfy God's righteous standard, the righteous son? What could satisfy God's righteous price, the righteous son? And what could suffice to pay our way out of slavery? His shed blood. Listen, the adopted of God do not receive Blood-born rights from God. But blood-bought rights from God. Did you hear what I said? Because that's the essence of adoption in one sentence. The adopted of God do not receive blood-born rights, but blood-bought rights. Just as you bring someone into your home who has no rights according to your blood or lineage and you bestow on them rights into your family, so God has done this, but it costs far more. It costs the death of His own Son. Were you listening to that passage in Hebrews earlier? Were you listening? He was not ashamed to be called brother Jesus He was not ashamed to be called their brothers, but he had to become like his brothers. How? In the flesh. Why? So that he could bleed. To free his brothers from slavery to sin. To free his sisters from slavery to sin. How much does God love you? He loves you enough to make you a part of His people. But God loves you so much, He'll make you a part of His family. He wanted you so much according to His purpose and His will for His own glory, and for your goodness, that we would stand before Him faultless and blameless, that His righteous Son would take the fall so that the welcomed sons and daughters could stand. You say, well, why would He do this? Why would he do this? Good question. Paul answers it. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Now look with me at the deliberate desire. The deliberate desire. This word for will here refers generally. It's, it's, it's not a specific word. It, has, it doesn't have any special implications. It has the idea of desire or objective. In other words, why did God do this? this? Because he wanted to. It's what he wanted to do. Which, by the way, is why God does everything. God does everything. Read this passage. After the counsel of his own will, he does what he wants to do because what he wants to do is right. God does nothing out of guilt, obligation, coercion, manipulation, or pressure. Yesterday, I was, at a, I was at a farmer's market with my wife, because that's really the only reason to go for a farmer's market is with your wife. Just kidding. And it wasn't really a farmer's market. I, I didn't see any vegetables at the farmer's market. <laughs> it, was, it was all like crafts and stuff, you know? And um, there was this little girl there, and she was selling macaroons, which, you know, very agrarian, right? Um, and I walked up to her tent. I had no desire to buy macaroons. And she said, look, look at the end. I said, what you got there? And she, and she said, oh, I make them. And I was like, oh, no. It's like a six-year-old girl making her own macaroons, and she's got a little tent, and she's designed her little things. And she's like, do you want some? 
It's like, yes. I don't even like macaroons. So I got them. And they were good. They're great. I did it for the little girl. I was unduly coerced. God is not manipulated by his people. God is not up there going, oh, this one's so cute. I guess I'll say yes. God does what he wants to do. And what he wants to do is right. So what does he want in this verse? Well, the word here for purpose actually helps. It's, it's more than just the idea of intention or motivation. It specifically maintains an idea of something done out of favor or good will. So God's purpose here is to express his favor or pleasure toward us. This is another aspect of the blessedness of verse 3 that he expresses toward us. So God doing this, his adopting us, expresses his good will towards us, expresses his, expresses his blessedness, verse 3. How does this then reveal that favor or express his goodwill? Look at me at verse 6. To the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. So fourthly, verse 6 talks to us about the praiseworthy purpose. In this verse, we have the phrase to the praise of his glorious grace which occurs again in, verses, in verse 12 and in verse 14. It's almost like the, the, the responsive chorus of a really good hymn. And so what is expressed in the will of God? His glorious grace or the unmerited favor with which He has blessed us. This, by the way, is a different kind of blessing than in verse 3. It's a different word altogether. It specifically has the idea of a gift something that wasn't earned but given. Literally, verse 6 could read this way, God's glorious favor with which He has favored us. You say, well, what's the gift there? What did you do to get God's favor? Nothing. The favor is the gift. And if you really want to know what that glorious grace looks like, look back at verse 5. That in love he predestined us to adoption as sons. You could summarize the passage this way. Why did God choose you? Verse 5, because he loves you. Why does God love you? Because he wants to. Why did God adopt you? Because he wanted you to know his love. And why does, and how does he prove that he loves you? By being, verse 6, gracious to you. And why would he be gracious to you? So that, verse 6, you would praise him to the praise of his glorious grace. You know that funny, actually it's not that funny because it's been told too many times, that, that phrase that pastors use, maybe you've used it, you're giving someone the gospel, if you got to heaven today and St. Peter met you at the gates, and he said, why should I let you in? You know, that, you know that hypothetical that we always do? It's actually, for the biblical Christian, a really dumb question. Because the obvious answer to that is, this is my home. Why wouldn't you let me in? This is just, I mean, I'm, this is my dad's house. I'm here because I'm his child. Child. 
You could ask the question that might be better, well, how are you his child? How did that happen? God's gracious. God loves me. God wanted this. And so, what God did was he sent my perfect older brother, Jesus Christ, to take everything wrong that I would do on himself on the cross and and buy me out of slavery and give to me an inheritance that can't be taken away of divine spiritual worth. Because my, my father doesn't just want people He wants children. Well, why does he want children? Because the love between a parent and a child is so much different than simply the honor and respect between a servant and a king. And he knows in being our father, we get to enjoy him. And we know that in being our father, we thank him and praise him. So listen, this morning, I don't know how you look at God. I don't know how you look at God. Maybe this is the first time you've ever heard this. But I'm going to say what I said a few moments ago. The reality that God through his son's blood would purchase sons to himself can change you forever. And I'm talking about if you've not believed in Christ for your salvation. And I'm talking about if you have. Because no longer is he out there and he's unattainable and you don't understand him and he's impersonal. He is your perfect father who proved his love eternally. And you and I stand before him. We enter his home saying, this is our home too. And we do so, not because we deserve to be there, or not because we have rights in and of ourselves, but because Jesus provided payment so that believers don't just become kingdom dwellers, they become sons and daughters. And his children offer him praise because we know the pleasure of knowing Father. 